I'll give you a quick little background about myself. Um, I'm delighted to be presenting this to you um, for the Bruce. I'm a Connecticut based painter, printmaker and photographer and um, my studio is based in South Norwalk. My um, background is um, somewhat varied, but all within the fine arts. Uh, my undergraduate was in metalsmithing and textiles and um, my master's degree was in new media. Um, I've studied and worked in a tremendous amount of media over the years. I work three-dimensionally as well as two-dimensionally, uh, but for the most part, I, I do create my work with an amalgam of, of painting, printmaking, and uh, photography. Um, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to doing this with you. Um, and I think as soon as Corinne gets back, we are going to get started. Okay, we've got the thumbs up. So in front of you, you surprisingly enough, this was not planned. But um, in my research about Emily, I found that she comes from a long line of painters and printmakers. Um, her great great grandfather was John Trumbull who was very, very well known as the painter of the American Revolution. So how amazing that I should be presenting to you on this very first day and with her <laughs> great, great, great grandfather's paintings in the Capitol um, on inauguration day. So the first painting that you see here was actually uh, illustrating the signing of the documents for the Declaration of Independence, and it is titled as such. Um, the next piece here is also one you may very well recognize from your United States history classes. This was uh, George Washington resigning his commission. And as you can see, these are so incredibly well executed uh, in a realistic painting style of the times. Next in her artistic lineage was Emily's mother, whose name was Alice Trumbull Mason. This is one of her pieces and she was co-founder of the Abstract American Artist Group in 1935, this was created. And now she is really uh, very much known and considered as the pioneer of American abstraction. But sadly, her work was really overlooked for decades and decades due to the fact that she was a woman. Um, she studied in Europe. She had a very good education in the United States prior to that. And um, she adhered uh, quite readily to many of Modrian's principles, uh, which can be seen in most of her work where there's um, a subtle and sometimes overt nod towards the grid. Uh, this particular painting was called Bearings in Transition and it was created in 1947. Um, unlike Emily, her mother, Alice, uh, created very, very detailed preliminary drawings prior to even starting a painting. And um, uh, this particular painting showcases her exploration and definition of space through color shifts using strong uh, contrasting verticality that you see there in uh, those pole-like um, images. And uh, those were placed over top of some diaphanous uh, biomorphic forms in pale hues. So she was experimenting with that push and pull uh, in this particular painting. As we move to another painting of her mother's, this one is called Staff, Distaff and Rod. And this was created in 1952. Um, 
as you can see, this painting is uh, appears uh, to be much bolder. It's stronger. Um, it's just different from the other one, but yet there are some elements that remain the same. Uh, in this particular one, unlike having the diaphanous uh, backdrop, here the backdrop is is dark and um, in a lot of contrast to the um, vertical elements, which in this particular painting are in lighter colors. So here again, she plays with space. She plays more with transparency than in the prior painting and with contrast. And here she also used somewhat of a modified palette. Uh, and uh, very much so she uses more hard edge defined shapes. So, you know, thanks to curators and art historians who remained vigilant to place uh, Alice Trumbull Mason in the history books, as well as Emily, who really, really, really made a concerted effort throughout her life uh, to create her mother's legacy in the art world. She finally um, was recognized and as she should have been during her lifetime. In fact, during her lifetime, her mother only sold 10 paintings, which is, um, you know, a sad, a sad reflection of the times. And now you can see her mother's paintings uh, at some of the finest galleries in the world selling for, you know, $150,000, $250,000. So moving along, despite her pedigree of um, her great, great, great grandfather being a, a realist, her mother, uh, being heavily influenced uh, by the abstraction movement and actually a co-founder of the American abstraction movement. Um, Emily's own work is a departure from that of her ancestors. Uh, while she clearly enjoyed playing with spatial entities like her mother, she tended to opt for a lively, fresh vibrancy of organically derived shapes and forms. Um, her mother's work was very, very planned out as I had explained to you and she did all, all sorts of um, uh, preliminary drawings, but uh, Emily really relied on her intuition and the immediacy of gesture. So it's funny because when you look at her paintings, um, you might think, oh, this painter must live on an island in the Caribbean. And, um, you know, there in, in many of the paintings that you'll see, you'll see these bold, delicate waves of color that seemingly uh, caress and wash over one another um, in primarily analogous hues, which was her tendency in her color choice. Um, her heightened sense of color was earned through uh, years of formal study, both here in the US and, and also uh, in Europe. Um, where she also spent time uh, having been awarded a, a Fulbright. Um, one thing about Emily that was also a bit different from her predecessors was that um, although she spent a lot of time in the city, she also had a home in Vermont and uh, she would go to Vermont for long stretches of time, particularly in the spring, summer, fall, and uh, she would begin paintings there. Um, and then she would bring them back to New York and she tended to finish them when she was back in New York in the studio. And it's, and it's sort of funny to hear when I was reading about her that she used to joke that she needed to finish the paintings in her New York City apartment where the light was the best, it, which, it, which was really funny because if you, you know, if you talk to a lot of New York based painters, a lot of them have uh, have had summer places in the Hamptons and they always talk about how fabulous the light is in the Hamptons and that they can't really do the same work in the city that they're doing out on the island. Uh, so I, I chuckled a little bit when, when I read that. Um, so, you know, she did, she did find a lot of value in, in being in the country and took a lot of her forms uh, from that. And even as you look at this, you can see the light and the liveliness does uh, bring forth the ideas of, of being outside 
rather than in an urban um, environment. Um, this piece here she created in 1932. Um, it was entitled Sounded. Um, so again, you know, it, it when when you look at this, um, you do get a sense of space, you get a sense of organic shape, you can Im import onto this your own idea of um, is this a uh, was this derived from sitting outside and painting the hills in Vermont or was this something that came out of her her own mind? Uh, here you can see she's working with um, predominantly complementary colors and with the analogous color being the violet uh, and the blues. Emily also worked um, in uh, smaller sizes, I would say 15 by 22, um, which is a, a standard half sheet size of, uh, of printmaking paper, which is, or watercolor paper, which uh, when you buy them by the sheet are tend to be 30 by 22. Um, and this particular piece was a work uh, oil on paper and it's entitled Bottom Line. This was done in 1967. Uh, she had spent multiple times in her life in Venice um, where her observations of architectural surroundings uh, also acted as a muse. Uh, the reason that she was first introduced to Venice um, was when she was awarded a Fulbright in 1957. And then she later returned there and married artist Wolf Kahn in 1958. And together they returned again in 1959 to Venice to, um, to work. Um, this is another example of Emily's work um, on paper. This particular one, however, uh, shows her gestural work in pastel atop a dry oil painting on paper. And um, I like the title for this one. It's called Blame the Bee. So if you look at it, you see these buzzing of activity in her, uh, in her gesture in the pastel. Um, and you can imagine that. This was done during her time in Maine in 1962, where she spent some time at Deer Isle. Uh, this is another oil painting. Um, I'm not really certain where this one was from, but um, I thought it would be a good thing for you to see the spatial, um, organization is a little bit more complex, but yet at the same time, um, it tends to be mostly a monochromatic painting. This piece is more indicative of her time in Venice, where you can imagine that she might be um, strolling through some of the narrow alleyways in Venice and um, with buildings uh, on either side. Um, people like to stroll a lot in the evening in Venice too. Uh, so this again here she's using a little bit more structure to her piece. Um, whereby when she gets older, she tends to shy away from uh, the more structured abstract pieces. And we'll go into a lot of that next week when we start talking more about her color. Um, what I would like to do right now is I'd like to really talk to you about the process that we're gonna be doing today. First of all, does anybody have any questions about any of the 
images or about her, the brief history that I've brought to you about her. Okay. Um, so let's talk about what is a monotype. Um, oftentimes this word is misappropriated and people may say, oh, I just finished a monoprint because it's a form of printmaking. So they think monoprint should be the term that they should use for that. Um, a monotype is actually a one of a kind, unique piece of artwork. It's really the simplest form of printmaking. It requires only some pigments, a surface on which to apply them, paper, and either some form of an intaglio printing press or things like your wooden spoons, um, your barren, uh, if you happen to have a, a good heavy rolling pin, that can come in handy too. Um, Frank Howell, who was a Santa Fe artist who really became an expert on the medium of monotypes, most clearly describes the process that monotypes are pooled impressions that are drawn or painted on either a metal or a plexiglass plate. So there are many, there are different ways that we will uh, create our images. Uh, they can be created through applications of ink that are rolled, like we'll do with the brayer. They can be brushed on. They can be daubed on. Um, and what I mean by that is you can use a, a, a cheesecloth or a tarlatan, or you can even use paper towels and daub certain colors of ink on. Um, and you can choose to manipulate or not manipulate the ink once it has been applied to your printing uh, plate. Um, so generally, uh, these images are printed onto a piece of paper. Um, however, they don't have to be. They can be printed on something else. Um, there are also different types of uh, papers that can be used, and we're going to talk about that in our third uh, class. But monotypes, the main thing I'm trying to impart to you is that they're inherently unique because only one or two impressions can be pulled before the ink is used up. So although there might be enough ink left on your plate after you pull the first one to create a second one, you can do that, but then that one has to be called a ghost impression. Uh, it tends to be much lighter, much thinner. It's a little bit of a ghostly image of the first one, hence the name ghost. Uh, and every single pulled impression may be considered a finished work or like you saw Emily Mason do, uh, you can further enhance it either after it's dry with pastel, with um, paint, uh, with colored pencil, with watercolor, uh, but you don't have to. So what is a mono print actually? Well, a mono print is not wholly unique. It begins with a plate that already has some uh, image applied to it. So what does that mean? It can be a plate that has an etching it can be a seriograph, it can be a lithograph, or it can be a collagraph. Um, this gives you an underlying image that remains the same and is common to every single piece in a given series. So what you would be adding is you would be uh, changing the background, for example, or you would be changing the color within the confines of that underlying image. So. A, a mono print has a similar um, aspect to it. And many people create a series of them. So if you think sometimes um, an example may be, um, and I'm not certain actually that they are mono prints, they may be lithographs, but 
when you think about Jim Dine's work and you think about the bathrobe series, okay? They're a series that they all have the same bathrobe, but they were done in different colors. So that if he in fact did use the, the monoprint process for that, that's just a visual example for you to reference. Um, so questions about the monotype versus the monoprint, anyone? No questions, a very quiet group. <laughs> okay. So I think we're gonna move on to actually creating a monotype. How does that sound? Um, feel free to keep yourself unmuted because we don't have a, a large group. And unless you have your dog barking or a television in the background or something, um, feel free to stay unmuted so that we can chat. Um, however, it, it, it is up to you. Um, now, what I would like to do is I would like to ask each of you if you have your paper ready and if you have your printing plate ready. And uh, because what I would like to do is I would like to go over how to um, prepare your paper size if you have not done that. Because having never printed before, why would you know how to do that, right? This printing plate seems to have is this protective plastic on either side? Do I take that off? Yes, yes. Please take off. that off. That's off perfect. Both both sides. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. And then um, once you do that, if you have some rubbing alcohol nearby, do you have any of that? Yep. Okay. So. And this um, is just Nancy. Yes. Nancy, is there something else that I can use if I don't have rubbing alcohol? Um, uh, yeah, you could use, um, vinegar. Okay. I have apple cider vinegar, but that works. That's okay. Okay. That's okay. All right. That'll, that'll work fine. You know, it's just really to be like a cleansing agent for you. Okay. So that, yeah, that's fine. It will just remove any dust or any, um, adhesive that may have been there underlying. Okay. I'm just gonna run and grab my other alcohol because this spritz bottle is stopped up for some reason. Okay, so I'm going to set up my other camera right now. so that you can see what I'm doing. Oh, let me move this to that. Okay. okay. So basically, I have my CVS alcohol, um, which I'm sure most of us have a lot of something. You know, even if you have alcohol wipes from the pandemic, you can use those too. <laughs> and then I'm just going to clean my plate just to be sure there's nothing there that I don't want on it. Mm. And now is probably a good time that if you want to 
Um, well, no, you can wait because I'll I'll show you how to tear your paper first. Nancy, can I can I say something? Um, yes. We have, we have that image next to you. I like to have your image big on my screen so that I see what you're doing. Do we need that image of the fences? I think you, well, you might need it. You don't have to use it. You can make your own uh, creation. So if you want to, then you can take uh, the smaller image of me. Where I'm I think Nancy, I think you're gonna have to stop the presentation in order for your smaller image to be big, if that makes okay. sense. Okay, all done. Okay, there we go. Ah, Eureka! <laughs> ah, perfect. Uh, thank Good. you. Okay. How's that? Better? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So, I'm not sure how you purchased your paper. Um, this was actually a 22 by 30 inch sheet, which I had torn in half. And um, if you are working from a pad of paper, then that's fine. You probably don't have to do any tearing. But for those of you who may have purchased individual sheets of paper, um, I'm going to show you uh, a couple of uh, couple of options for yourself. So this is my plate size here, which is kind of a little bit of a elongated uh, plate. Um, and if you can see, I have, oh, about a two, two and a half inch border all the way around when I place my plate on here. Now that's something that I personally would like to have but that does not mean that you need to have that or that you even like that look. You could also, here's my plate. If I put it like this and I cut it, I cut this piece rather in, in half, I'll just show you. So if I cut it in half like this, I will have a border. However, if I decide to just cut it into quarters, then I won't have a border. And then this would be called what we refer to as a full bleed. So if any of you have ever worked in publishing, you know that a full bleed means that the image takes up the whole entire page and there's no gutter. There's no room for um, uh, margins. So it's really um, a very personal decision. Uh, some printmakers, only work with full bleed, some only work with margins, and, uh, and many artists um, make that decision based upon the image that they're gonna be working with. So, um, nevertheless, I need to tear my paper down. So let me show you how to do that. So here you have your paper, and you literally wanna fold it in half. You wanna meet the edges to one another and then use your fingers with a little bit of considerable pressure and make a crease. Um, if you're using the 140 pound Fabriano paper, it can be a little bit stiff. And um, I find that you may want to stand. So if I were to get rid of my stool right now and stand, I tend to stand anyway when I'm printing, then I can have all that upper body strength on my paper edge, okay? If you happen to have a, if you have a spatula that you will later be using for your colors, you can feel free to move that along the edge. To help you to create a stronger crease. And then you want to fold it back again and do the same thing. There are also some other ways 
that you can do this, but this works fairly well and consistently. So then you want to open it up. Once you've secured your crease and I happen to be right-handed. So I'm going to put the pressure on my left hand up at the top of my page up here. And with my other hand over here, I will slowly begin to tear. Now, the reason that I keep this hand very stern and strong is I want to avoid any tears that are gonna go awry. And don't worry, if it goes awry, it's not a big deal. But we like to try to avoid that. Now you might say to me, Nancy, why are we tearing this? Can't I just put it in a paper cutter? Can't I just use scissors? Yes, you can do all of those things. You can use an X-Acto knife, whatever you like. However, part of the beauty of this particular paper and other handmade papers like it is that it has a feathery edge which is called a decal and that's one of the ways that you can tell that a paper has been handmade so when i'm tearing down a larger sheet i like to maintain the integrity of that handmade paper by emulating a decal as best i can by tearing it by hand Okay, I'm gonna lay that one to the side. And then I'm gonna take the other half of it because I wanna sh show you both sizes again. And I'm going to use my clean palette knife and just move that along. Uh, if you happen to be someone who makes books and you have um, a, a bone folder this would be a good time to use a bone folder. That works perfectly well. But this works well too. Okay, so I've done that several times. And now I'm gonna come and tear this. Okay. So now I have three different sizes here. I have the smaller one, which I can use for a full bleed or my image going from edge to edge, or I have a larger sheet that will give me a border all the way around. So that's the first step is getting your paper ready. You know, when you're printing, there are times when um, you're in the clean area, as I like to call it, or the dirty area. So the clean area is anything involving your nice, clean paper. You don't want to have ink anywhere near. You don't want to have paintbrushes nearby. You don't want to have brayers nearby. You want to have that clean area off to the side. So... Um, as you can see here, I have my nice clean towel over here. And I'm going to be using that to dampen the paper before printing. Um, when, you, when you're working small at home, you can also if you prefer, if you have a small uh, Rubbermaid container like this, or perhaps a, a, a Pyrex cooking tray that will fit your paper in, uh, you can certainly use this and put some water in the bottom uh, about an inch or two, and you can use that to dampen your paper. But you will still need to have um, a towel on which to dry it. So how's everyone doing? You're getting your paper torn? Yeah, tearing the paper. Does it need okay. to be the same size as the, um, the as plexiglass? Plate? 
Well, that's the thing. I'll give you two, I'll show you two different options. So here in this situation, mine is essentially the same size as my plate. So that will give me what we call a full bleed image. And what I mean by that is if you were to look at this photograph by itself, there's no border. It's just the whole thing is the photograph. But if you want the photograph or your image, your print to have a border like this, then you would want to trim your paper to allow for a border. So in this case, I made one size that allowed a border. So if you can see that here, I have Oh, about two, two and a half inch border on this do sheet. Mark, do you mark your borders, uh, Nancy? Do you put like pencil marks on each corner or you just... That is um, a very good thing to do. Once your paper is um, torn and if you're planning to use a border like this one, then I would definitely get a, a light pencil and I'll show you how to, uh, to go ahead and mark that. Okay, um, in most cases you can, depends on how you see, but you can t tend to eyeball where you want the center to be, but um, it, it's always good to check that. So here I have two inches on either side there and two inches on the top there and a little bit more on the bottom. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, now that this is placed, I'm gonna hold down my plate and just make a little tiny corner indication. Now there are two there are two different ways that I'll show you to print. One is where you'll put put it face down. Another way is where your plate is down here and then you're placing your paper here. So um, Nancy, I have a question. What if your paper ends up being smaller than your um... than the plate? Yeah, is it totally like worthless? <laughs> no, no, not at all, not oh. at all. Um, so how much smaller is it? Is it smaller uh, height-wise or width-wise? Uh, can I both. make a suggestion that you, um, you might want to turn on your camera so Nancy can see? Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, okay. so let's see. Can you see? I don't know if you can uh, see it. I see. Oh, I see. You have, um, it's a little bit taller and a little bit wider. Yeah. Okay. So this is what I would recommend for you. Do you have a, um, do you have a Sharpie marker? Yeah, I do. Okay. And a ruler? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. So what I would do in your case is um, I would let's say this is your piece. Okay. Here's your plexiglass. Um, oh, actually yours goes the other way. Hold on. Your plexi is bigger. So what I would do is I would mark off on the plexi where the paper stops. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So that way you'll know when you're creating your image that you don't have to go further than that mark because otherwise okay. you're you're going to be off your paper. Okay, sounds good. Okay, does everyone understand that? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Now, um, I I have uh, pieces of newsprint that I have down here um, because things tend to get a little bit messy. And so I'm trying to keep my table paper sort of clean. Um, so in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this newsprint and I'm going to make a mark here where I'm going to have my plate. And you don't have to do this. This is just another way that you can work. And then I'm going to take this other piece that I have here, which is almost a full bleed. And I'm just going to mark off the corners of that paper. Um. Uh, Nancy, I just want to let you know we have uh, Paige joining us. Hi, Paige. Sorry about the difficulties getting in. Hi, Paige. <laughs> Welcome. And Paige, you're muted, so I can't hear what you're saying. Um, but it seems like you're saying nice things, so that's good. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, 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 don't, I kept trying, and then I just got a code to call in, and um, and then I gave it one more try, and. Oh, I, I really well, apologize for that. Just so you know, we are recording the workshop, so we'll be oh, you'll be able to access the part that you didn't see um, eventually. But I'm gonna <laughs> I'm Corinne. I'm from the museum. I'm gonna mute myself and turn my video back off. But I just wanted to let Nancy, our instructor, know you were you were joining us. And Thank again, so my apologies. Yeah, I don't. I Hi, don't welcome, Hi. welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so sorry to to be getting in so late that's it's okay amazing. have have you ever um have you ever done printmaking before Never. okay Never. so um so what we're doing right now is we're just getting set up and uh so i just showed everyone how to tear their paper um do you have your printing plate yes okay two different i have this uh-huh this i don't know if Wait, is this printing plate? No, this is not printing plate. What is printing no, plate? No, that's, that's, that's your palette paper and the palette paper uh, you will use to roll your ink on, okay? Yes. Yes. So you don't, wanna you don't wanna remove the palette paper from, um, from the pad. You wanna just keep it on the pad. Okay. Okay? okay. Um, but the paper that you'll be printing on is the paper that I'm referring to right now. So do you have one sheet of watercolor paper or something? Oh, good, okay, great. So the Fabriano paper that you have on the right. Um, that would be this one? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay. okay, so you can uh, take one piece of paper off of that pad, the, the red one, the red oh. Fabriano, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Now your plexiglass plates is how big compared to your um, paper? <coughs> you, can re you can remove the, um, the coating. There's usually a plastic coating on either side of those plates. You can remove that. Okay. You're getting the speed version, Paige. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, okay. I'm not having success of finding another coat or layer, but while she's getting that off, Nancy, I realize that your your everyone else's um, plate seems to be rigid, and mine is. Whoops! If you if the camera was on, you could see. Yeah, if you want to put your camera on, that would be helpful. Let's see. Mine mine came. Oh, you have a jelly plate. Yeah. Okay. That's Do I okay. need? To uh, do I need to get a different kind of plate for next time? Uh, yeah, it would probably be helpful for you. But, um, but, uh, but for now, you can you can use your jelly plate today, without a problem. Um, so with your jelly plate, 
What I would recommend to you is, um, let me think about this for a second, is that you would, um, you would be keeping your plate here on the table and then you'll be putting your damp paper on top of it, okay? Okay. And one more question. Um, yeah. My paper is covered with news, newspaper. Um, That's fine. When the back of this seems to pick up the, the ink, but is that all right? Sure. Okay. Remember, everything we're doing is the great experiment. Okay. <laughs> so just relax and know that whatever you're going to do, you're going to learn something from. Whether it's going to be something you love or whether it's going to be something... <laughs> Maybe you don't love so much today, but um, but through the process, you will learn um, the many different things about printmaking. One thing that we often refer to in printmaking are happy accidents, uh, which is uh, something that we commonly refer to what, you know, uh, other intaglio printmakers such as... Uh, uh, etchers might say, oh my God, it ruined the whole plate. Well, the bonus that you have with the monotype is that there really are no mistakes per se. Um, and we can, we can work with everything. So we'll turn something that you might not love into something that you'll love. There's a very that makes cute sense. book called um, a, Be uh, a Beautiful Oops. And it's one that <laughs> I read to my daughter. And um, we used to read it all the time, but it's like how to have, you make a, a little mistake and it winds up being this beautiful mistake and it's, they call it a beautiful, <laughs> it's a really cute little book about, um, you know, looking at something half full, it might not be a, a mistake, but um, uh, you can turn oh, that's it into great. something wonderful. So that's really great. Cool. Okay, so I, okay, I was so if you're, okay, so yeah. the main thing Paige is that you can either have your paper this is example one. You can have your paper and your plate um, of a different size, therefore enabling you to have a border all the way around, okay? Mm -hmm. Or you can choose to do what we call a full bleed, whereby your plate size and your paper size are pretty much the same. I love the border. Um, okay. Yeah. So. But if I didn't want to, is there a, um, a way that you're suggesting to, to cut it? If, if I yes. wanted to have that? Yes. Um, but if you like the border, I do. I'm going to be your Don't border. Worry. Then let's just go with that. Okay. 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 And I can talk to you after class about how to further modify it. Okay. So everyone, um, what are we going to do now? Well, the reason that I had that imaged up before um, was because I would, I, I'm not sure if any of you have an image in mind, if you have uh, a photograph or some sort of reference of something that you would like to do. Um, as I said to you earlier in the presentation, Emily uh, really didn't plan things ahead of time so much with drawings like her mother did. So you can wing it and just go for it. If you would like to have a little bit of structure, however, just to follow for today's purposes, um, I had entered with this image, uh, which let me see if I can get it back here for you. I'm not sure I can, but let's see, maybe I can. Okay, so see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, you can see it. Okay, that's great. I can't see it, but at least you can see it. Okay, so if you look at this image, I chose this because um, when you just look at the line and you just look at the space, uh, this can create an abstracted landscape. So let's look at it like this. Is everybody on? Can you still see me? Yes. Okay. Because it looks like I lost connection on one 
of my devices. Um, I, I don't see you. I just see the handle of the lamp. Oh, okay. But do you see the picture on the screen? I do see the picture, yes. Okay, great. Okay, so now I'm going to move to this picture. So can you see this line drawing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So do you see what I've done here? I've, I've looked at this and what I did was I simply get my little pen out. I simply followed the lines that I saw, just the basic lines. So I'm using this as an example because it's simple and um, you don't have to use this by any means. You can choose your own image, but I wanted to show you how you could um, dissect your image from and being something does. super realistic to something more abstract dividing the space. And the lines, you do them on, on the plexiglass? You can do them. If, if you think that you need um, some very strict guidelines on your plexiglass, yes, you can do them on one side of your plexiglass with, um, with a, a Sharpie, but then you would turn your, um, your plate over and you would actually put the ink in on the opposite side so that you would end up with the same orientation on your print. So I know that's a lot of information to take in. When you make a print, however you create your print, when you print it, you will be getting the opposite orientation, okay? So it's like what happens in a mirror. So does, is that clear for everybody? Yeah. But okay. right now you're putting those lines on the on the picture itself, what you're doing right now. Yeah, I'm just for just illustrating for you. So um, here in the next slide, you see I just created this. Now this is this I created on a separate piece of paper, just on a piece of scrap copy paper. Um, just so that I could loosely refer to it. Uh, you could also keep it on a piece of um, uh, copy paper, and then you could put your plexiglass plate over top of that if you want. That's another way to, to work if you want something specific. Um, I, wanna, I want to um, emphasize that because I think just for learning purposes, it could be helpful for you just to learn how to break down a space uh, that you might see uh, looking out your window or a space that you might see looking um, at a landscape photo um, to help you to create something that's a little bit more abstract if you're used to creating a realistic artwork. So any questions as far as that goes? Okay, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get rid of this image because I need to get my camera back so that you can see what I'm gonna do, okay? So is everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, here we go. Okay, so let's get this put back up here. And okay. So, so once again, my clean paper that I'll be printing from, I have over on the side on my towel. I'm going to show you uh, if you wanted to create something um, and you wanted to put it uh, underneath, you could, but you can also just take a Sharpie marker and trace it like this. 
and the Sharpie marker, by the way, comes off with rubbing alcohol. Okay, so just to give me something, some vague idea. Now, if I want my final image to be in this orientation, then I can apply my ink on top of this, just how I drew it. However, if I want it to, if I want it to, uh, when it prints, if I do it that way, my image will look like this. It'll be the reverse. But if I want it to look like this finished, then I have to turn this over and reverse it. Does that make sense? I know it's a little, this is the most confusing part usually for people. Is everybody following me with that? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, so what I'm gonna do right now is let's get our gloves on. All right. Now you can keep this very simple and just use a couple of different paint colors, which is what I'm going to do. Um, I have a, a light violet version and for the sake of time, I'm not even really going to be mixing colors so much today. Uh, so here I've squeezed out a little bit onto my palette. Can everyone see that? No, can you, I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay, so I just took a little bit of my paint and I just squeezed it out on my paper palette. If you don't have a paper palette and you have a second plexiglass plate, you can use the plexiglass plate. And then I'm just gonna take my brayer and I'm going to start to move my ink around in all different directions. It's kind of like working with cake frosting. It has a lot of peaks until you really get it smoothed out. So if you wanted a cake that was iced, that had all these lovely little peaks and valleys, then you wouldn't do too much with it, right? But if you wanted a cake that had a very, very smooth surface and finish to it, you would just keep going over it and over it until you had that consistency. So that's what I'm doing here. So if you don't do it too much, it adds texture. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, but it can be problematic in that your brayer might not be fully covered. And um, that's why it's important to fully roll it back and forth so that you're covering the whole entire brayer with ink. The other thing is if you have too much ink on your brayer and it's too thick, then you're going to have what we call the squish factor, which means once the paper goes on and you start pressing this, the, the ink is going to smush out all on the edges of your paper, which you're probably not going to want to have. So I would caution you about that. I really prefer for you to uh, make your ink very consistent and very smooth because I think you'll have much better results. Okay, so now I'm going to start to apply this to, to my plate. Now, you, I'm using oil paint today here uh, because I recognize that etching inks are very expensive and this is a workshop and you're not even sure you're gonna like printmaking. So I felt it was important for you to have a choice because many of you are artists and you probably have oil paint laying around somewhere anyway. So, um, So now, as you can see, we have this area pretty much covered, right? You can hold it up to the light 
in your house or your studio or wherever you are and make sure that it's as consistent as you would like it to be. Okay. Now, because my next color um, is not going to be um, out of this violet family, uh, what I'm going to do rather than fully clean my brayer is I'm going to take some of my paper towel or if you have um, if you have some newspaper around, you can just roll some of this color off of this. And I couldn't do this if I wasn't in the same color family. And also for time's sake today, I'm going to do that. Okay, so now I'm going to bring this over here. I'm just gonna turn my paper palette around a little because I want this lilac which is a little bit bolder. Keep in mind now I'm not, I have not mixed any colors, which normally I would be doing. Um, so I'll be doing the same thing here. I'll move this over so that you can see. Now, sometimes you get some paints that are a little bit stiffer. Now you see how this one is acting? It's very stiff, isn't it? So what I'm going to do with this one is I'm gonna add a little tiny bit of that plate oil that was on your list. I, I had a hard time finding plate oil. I don't, I don't know if, okay. if like this, Work. I mean, I've got a bunch of different types of. Uh, Do you have walnut oil or? Um, I have. I'll have linseed oil. I've got this gal cow. I don't know. Uh, Do you have a poppy oil? Do you have a poppy oil? Poppy? No. Okay. I, um, um. And I have walnut oil, avocado oil. Oh, walnut oil. Yeah, use walnut oil. That's great. Okay, so if you have some walnut oil. This, the reason I said no to the um, linseed is it is it tends to get it um, very yellow and it will bleed into your paper over time. You know, you don't want to use a lot of oil, but just just enough to kind of get things a little unsticky. So I'm, I'm interested. I must have looked down at my own. I didn't see how you're brayer followed that line around rather than making a straight line with the edge of the brayer the line that you drew on the back of your oh your... how did i do that is that what you're asking me how did i yeah. do that yes thank you uh, okay um basically what i did was um i just paid attention to where i had those little curves that i wanted and I just moved my brayer like this in this direction. And then I came back and smoothed it over in between. Now keep in mind, everything we're doing today, we're using a brayer. You could also paint all of this on with a paintbrush. Um, in doing so, we'll, we'll be using a paintbrush more next week, but in doing so, um, you have to be ever more conscious of the viscosity of your paint. And what I mean by that is how thick or how thin it is. Because once again, if it gets too thick, then you're not gonna be, you know, all that happy with it. So, okay, so now I'm gonna come in here with this color. And sometimes it happens I've had this paint tube for a long time. So that's part of the reason why it was a little sticky. And as I see here, I'm noticing that it's got a few little things in it. If, if you find that there are some 
disturbing <laughs> little parts of your of your ink uh, that weren't properly ground, which sometimes happens when you're using these some of these handmade paints. Um, just just take your palette knife or a tweezer and pull them out. It's fine. Okay, so I'm moving along here. Hi, uh, Nancy, you said something about you, you usually mix paints. Uh, yes. You don't use just, you know, pure colors out of the tube. Why is that? Because of the balance. Um, well, my type of printmaking, the type of imagery that I tend to, to do um, is not necessarily the type that Emily does where she uses a lot of very bold colors and um, a lot of, you know, large abstract spaces. So it's just the nature of, of the way that I, I work, but I, you know, I, I'm very much committed to teaching you more how she was working uh, because, you know, we are doing this in conjunction with her beautiful exhibition, which we all can't wait to see as soon as the museum opens. But are you going to teach us a little bit about mixing colors and? Uh, yeah, I can, do, I can do some of that next week, yeah. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Okay, so I have a little bit of that now. And again, I'm going to go ahead and clean this off a little bit. Okay, now as you see, my paper palette is now full, isn't it, of violets. I'm switching colors now, so I'm going to remove that and I'm going to put that away in the garbage. And I am going to squeeze out another color. I am going to use a little bit of ultramarine deep here. Um, and normally I would be completely cleaning this, but I, for the essence of time here, for the sake of time, I'm going to just take a little bit of my vegetable oil quickly. And I'm just going to remove some of this violet. And if you only have one brayer, you'll, you know, you'll need to do this. With normally what, I beg your pardon? Uh, with vegetable oil? Yes, just regular vegetable oil, you know, whatever's the, whatever you have in your pantry, whatever's the least expensive. Obviously, I don't use the one from my kitchen. I have one that's designated for the studio. <laughs> but, um, okay. You don't want to use your alcohol on your brayers because it will dry out the plastic. Just as a little side note for you. Okay, so here we go. Can you see what I'm doing over here with the blue ultramarine here? Rolling this out. I can't see what you're doing. You can't, okay. Yeah, because I have my other, my other camera went out. I'm working with, I can't, I can't see what you all see. So I have to rely on what you tell me. So if you can't see something, I want you to shout out, okay? Okay, so now I am going to take this and I am going to put a little bit of it here.
and I actually might I actually might introduce the brush. Um, I'm going to just take my brush. I don't see you, Nancy. You don't see me at all. Oh. Okay. Uh, okay. Do you see me now? Okay. Yes. Do I need to fill all the areas of the um, plexiglass? I find that it's hard not to go over a color with a different within a, with a different color. Am I making sense? Um, yes. You, you know, this is your first time printing, so, um, and we're doing something a little bit complex for your first time printing, actually. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to stay in the style of Emily. So don't worry. Today's your experiment. Okay. Okay. You're going to go over things and, you know, maybe you're going to end up mixing colors that you don't like. Uh, and on second thought, you'll think, oh, gee, maybe I, I would have looked better if I had reversed these colors. All of those things will go through your mind. Okay. But that's okay because guess what? You have your plate, you have your brayers, you have your ink or your paint, and you can make another one. Yes. Yeah, I'm finding a and lot that, of little particles in the paint. Like you little, are finding particles? Yes. Um, but that, I that's tried, what I was. I tried this one and. I tried this one and what kind of paint are they new tubes? Gamblin, um, artist oil, sap green. Mm -hmm. And the other one I tried was Winston and Newton oil color. And I, I'm just, that's really unusual. Yeah. And they're new tubes. Yes. Hmm. Maybe they were on the shelf for a long time. Did you order them by mail or in person? No, I, I purchased them. Okay, well, maybe you can take them back to the place yeah. where you purchased them and say, you know, look, these must have been sitting around for a long time. Yeah. You know, you're perfectly within your right to do that for sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, can everyone see what I have done thus far? Yes. Okay. So here I'm just using a brush to go into this small area. Okay. And I will also use a brush to go into this last area here. I'm gonna use a little bit of cadmium yellow. As we know, Emily liked to work with uh, complementary colors from time to time. So is this where we use a bristle brush if we're using a brush? Yes, you can use or a bristle brush. Yes. Okay. You can use a bristle brush. You know, you're definitely not going to be using a watercolor brush, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to put a little bit of this in here now. Now notice when you use a brush, you also need to be somewhat aware of the direction of your brush strokes. Mm -hmm. Because you can use them to your advantage to dictate um, a line or a, a sense of line or a sense of direction. How's everybody doing? This is fun. <laughs> oh, you're going to have so much fun. And next week, it's going to be even more fun. Because you're going to be sir. But I, I just felt for the first day, you might like to have a little structure. Particularly if you may normally work in a more realistic style, just 
just learning how to break down something that's realistic into very simple shapes, I think is uh, important for you to learn. And it certainly relates to her work. Okay. So this is what I have right here, folks. What am I going to do next? Okay. This is important. Oh, by the way, one thing I just want to add is if you find that your ink went somewhere where you don't want it to go, that's when these Q-tips come in super handy because you can just navigate in and out very quickly and remove what you don't want, okay? So what I'm going to do now is I'm gonna remove my gloves because they're dirty, filled with paint at this point. And I am going to take my piece of paper that I have here and I'm going to take my spritz bottle. I'm gonna start on the opposite side and I'm gonna spritz it like grease. So my, my paper is on my towel over here and I'm spritzing it, letting it sit for a moment. And then, I'll take this off of here for a minute. I'm just gonna hold it because I think it will be better for you to see it like this. So here it is on my towel, right? Yes. All yes. damp. And I'm just gonna take it and I'm just going to wipe it with my paper towel, just as if you were cleaning off a kitchen counter or something like that. Okay, I'm gonna wipe it until it's no longer shiny. And then I'm going to turn it over and I'm gonna do the same thing again. But you said before that we can just use a bucket and just soak it. Yes, it. yes, you can also do that. <clears throat> but then that like, requires drawing too again. Well, so if you have, if you're planning to use a bucket or you're near a sink and you have your sink filled up, then what you would do is this. Here's my bucket. Let's, let's pretend that there's water in it, okay? And then I would, I would take my paper, I would put it in here, I would push it down, make sure it stays submerged, count to 10, and then turn it over. Again, resubmerge it like this, count to 10, take it off, and then you would put it on your towel again and wipe it dry. Okay, so you just wanna make sure that your paper is wiped dry and that it's not gleaming. But this is a time when you don't really want to waste a lot of time because you wanna make sure that the paper is still damp when you're um, working. Usually okay. how, long, how long time do you have between wiping it and really doing it? It should be- Well, made. I'm gonna do it right now. So that you're gonna see how long, not that long. You wanna just get it, you wanna get it down there. Okay, I'm gonna do this. And Okay, so once you put your paper down on top of your plate, then you wanna hold it with one hand and I like to sort of stroke your paper. Now, 
if you have a baron like this, then you would start at one corner. Always keep one hand holding your paper down. And I like to go along the edges of the paper so that I can create a crease mark where my edges of my plate are. And these, once you create that, it's called a plate mark. So let's say you are an amateur collector of prints and you go to a tag show or a tag sale or something and you say, oh my goodness, that looks like a marvelous print. And someone says to you, oh, well, it's a monotype. Well, you could check on the back side of that print to see if in fact it had a plate mark. If it did not have a plate mark, then it's not a monotype. Then it's more than likely a lithograph or um, a digital print. So um, the other thing that you can use um, is you can use one of these. A good old fashioned wooden spoon. Now, when you use a spoon, you wanna be careful to keep the flat side of, of the bottom side flat and you wanna use that. Except on the edges, you can use the edge of your spoon because some wooden spoons will leave a mark So that's why the Baron is best if you can get one of those. Keep in mind, all of these are alternatives to using an intaglio press, which is what we as professional printmakers use for the most part. However, being able to hand print like we're doing is really terrific because if we decide we're somewhere and we have limited resources, you can always make a print transfer with your hands, with a spoon, uh, with any other flat, smooth object. Um, if you have a heavy rolling pin, and this is not my heavy rolling pin, but just to illustrate, you would go along back and forth as if you were rolling out pastry dough. And then you would go the other side as well. Um, you have to be careful with the rolling pin because sometimes your plate will slip underneath. Okay. So now I'm gonna pull this up and you can see this very soft hand print. Can you see that? Can everyone see the print? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now see, purposefully, I wanted to show you what happens when you're using the spoon. If you use a little bit of the edge, you see the marks that are made here? Mm -hmm. So if you don't want those marks, then you have to really be sure about just using the flat. Um, so Randy, anyway, I'm jumping in because it's it's 11:35. It's 11:35. That's not even <laughs> possible. Well, this is our first day, so if if everybody can stay for a couple of more minutes, I'm happy to stay too. Sure. I'll come back. I'll come back in about 10. Okay. 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 How's everyone doing? This is amazing. <laughs> So each one's going to be different and unique and wonderful. Yes. And then the other fabulous thing is, let's say you printed one that you liked very much and you printed another one and you thought to yourself, oh, well, I like this one, but I might like this color to be a little bit more intense or that color to be a little bit more intense. So then once it dries, and because we're using oil paint, this will take about three days to dry. Once it's completely dry, then you can go on top of it with pastel, with oil pastel, uh, with watercolor, 
um, any any one of those things. Uh, there are other types of inks, um, you know, that that you can use like block printing inks. But the reason I I really feel strongly about the oil is the oil gives you the flexibility to be able to use other media on top of it. Another thing that we will learn how to do is multiple drops, where we may actually use two plates on top of one image. Um, we're not going to do that today, obviously, but um, it will um, enable you to do that with oil. You can't do that with the water solubles. Uh, so has everybody made their first print? I have a question. I'm a little behind and I just finished putting my um, paint on my plexiglass and you okay. said I'm supposed to spray the paper on both sides yes. and then dry yes. it? Yes. So what you want to do is you want to, um, do you have a uh, like a bath towel or something? Yes. Okay. So the first thing to do is just put your paper down on the towel and then use a spritz bottle if you have one with yeah. water and then spritz the whole surface of your paper okay right. okay then once you let that uh, soak in for a moment or two then you just take a paper towel and you just go across it as if you were wiping down your kitchen counter okay and you want to remove the oh, um right the glow so to speak then you would turn it over to the other side and repeat really spritz it well and um and then wipe it dry the main thing is when you're taking your paper and you're getting ready to put it down onto your plate you don't want it to be shiny or okay. drippy okay um, and nancy i can see your brush strokes on the paper on the blue. yes that's what you you were mentioning yes yes so yeah. so you can use the brush strokes see like in here you can see these yeah. brush strokes mm -hmm. um you can use the brush to your advantage to create something that you may want uh, so that's what i wanted to show you as far as that went um once a uh, page gets hers printed and everybody else gets theirs printed i i would like to show you another little fun trick not really a trick but it's just a fun adventure for you um which we will work with what's left on your plate and uh i'll show you another method you said something about um, a machine that you can uh, instead of doing it manually you can pass it through a machine you you mentioned the name but i didn't get it Yes, uh, an intaglio press. So that's I N T A G L I O. An intaglio press is a printmaking press that is used primarily for uh, monotypes, for etchings, for carborundum prints, for um, aqua tints. Uh, most. I beg your pardon. Is it um, very pricey or is it? Um, well, something? yes. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you really get the printmaking bug and you want to purchase one, um, you know, they, first of all, they are heavy. They take up uh, a bit of space. You can get a small tabletop one for probably about $800. Um, okay. But um, I have what, they call a half press um, because my studio is on the second floor and I wanted to be able to have a little bit mobility. I wanted it to be able to move around and I didn't want to have to reinforce the floors. Um, <laughs> so because they, they're, they're very, very, very heavy. Um, you know, they're all made of steel. And um, so mine, uh, mine, I'm trying to remember, mine was about, Fifty-eight hundred dollars. Uh, it was it was custom made for me. I have a bad back, and I wanted it to be raised up higher. And I also wanted them to put it on wheels so I could move it around my studio. But um, but a full size press. Um, that 
you know, runs you quite a bit of money, quite a lot more than, I mean, mine was enough to begin with. (laughs) But, uh, but when I say uh, half press, what that means is that a standard printmaking sheet size is 30 inches by 22 inches. So I can print uh, an 11 by 22, or I can print a 15 by 22. I, you know, I can print an 18 inch square. I can, so I have flexibility to, to print certain smaller prints. And then when I want to print larger prints, um, I'm able to use uh, the larger uh, presses at a couple of the different institutions where I teach. So, um, I'm sorry. I, I, um, I've, talk to me, Paige. I've, talk to me. <laughs> I've, I've gone over three different new papers because I keep getting paint on the outside part, border part. Um, okay. Okay. So now I've got one and it's okay. ready to go. So I okay. put it, the, the paper on top of the plate. Yes. On the, on top of the, yeah. Yes. And yes. do you have any like hints or tips on how to get it perfectly centered? Well, um, oh right, you came in after that part. You can make little marks on the paper that your plate is sitting on before you put a uh, paint on your plate. You can make little corner marks uh, with the paper that you plan on using. So okay. before, you, you know, beforehand, so that you know exactly where to place it. Okay, so before you leave everybody, what I really want to show you is um, here I'm going to make a full bleed print. So remember what we said about that. That means it's going to be uh, taking up primarily the whole sheet of paper. So this was that smaller piece that I had cut earlier and I'm going to spritz it again. I'm going to put it back though on my on my towel. So you can probably hear the spritzing, but I'm not going to remove my phone to show you that process again, because I think you have it down by now. And then I'm going to turn my paper over once again. I'm going to spritz it again. Okay, we, we just lost your picture. Uh-oh, that's not good. There you are. Okay. Okay, so what I wanted to show you next was if you take your alcohol and you go to your, something's wrong with this. Hold on one second. If you go to your alcohol, I have some in a bottle here too. And you lightly spritz your image with the alcohol and you let it sit for a minute. The image on the plate, right? Yes. Okay. This is fun for two reasons. Reason number one is you'll get a very interesting print. Uh, Number two is it will further assist in cleaning your plate without a whole lot of work. Mm. Okay, so so now I'm going to take that. I'm going to put that on top. Again, I'm going to hold it down. Oh, the paper is is spritzed with water again, right? Yes. Uh Uh-huh. I've spritzed both sides with water. my baron.
And actually, I find that when you're making your print transfer, if you stand up, it really makes a big difference in the transfer. You just don't get that same transfer quality when you're sitting down because you don't have your upper body weight leaning over your print. So if it's possible for you to stand when you're doing this part, it will help you. All right, I, I am back in here because it is 1145. Okay, hold uh, on one second. The great <laughs> reveal. Okay, so here is the ghost print, everybody. To which we had to which we had added alcohol. So you see it gives you this sort of muted sandy look. So it's very different from the other one. But anyway, it's fun. And so I thought it was a good thing to show you um, as a secondary print. Nancy, this was beyond wonderful. I just can't wait for the next sessions. Well, I'm so happy I to hear so that. Much. I'm I'm really uh, so delighted to have all of you on behalf of myself and Corinne and the Bruce Museum. We're we're delighted to be able to bring you programs like this, and um, we look forward to bringing you more. So now that you've gone through the process, you probably have a little bit better idea of how you want to be set up for next week and things that you might want to change or things that you might want to add. Um, definitely, you will think about next week making sure that you have your either walnut oil or plate oil. We will be using some of that next week. And um, of course, uh, your spritz bottles and um, your alcohol, all of those things. So thank you so much. If you have any other questions, um, I'm happy to stay on for another five minutes to answer them for you. Also guys, if you have questions after this, you can always send them to me via email and I'll share them with Nancy. Great. Um, That's I'll great. Out the links the okay. same way next week. So um, just keep an eye on your email and Paige, maybe next week we'll try to, I'll like maybe try to log in a little early next time. So, cause I want to make sure we get you in on time. Um, and I, yeah. I feel really bad that I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know either. Oh, one other, one other just quick little thing before I leave all of you. Um, uh, just a reminder for cleanup. Okay, here's my alcohol. I'm going to take it. I'm going to spritz it on my plate. And that's how you're going to clean your plate. Okay. Um, you can actually even print this. So there are many different fun things that you can do uh, through the cleanup process. But alcohol goes on your plate. Um, you use vegetable oil for your brayers, for your brushes. Once you get as much off as you can with the vegetable oil and paper towels, then you want to use a good uh, dish soap and warm water to clean these. And then when you're letting your brayers dry, it's best if you put them face up like this. Because if you dry them face down, they can get a little hot spot there and then they'll never roll properly again. And we don't want that, they're expensive, right? So thank you, everyone. We'd love to stay oh, on. Thank you. If, if Have fun, I hope you experiment this week. <laughs>